Good morning and welcome to today's operational information update on the flooding and landslide situation in BC. For today's briefing, we will have updates from Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General Mike Farnworth, Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Rob Fleming, and Minister of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries Lana Popham. A reminder to media on the line, please press star one to enter the queue. You will be limited to one question and one follow-up. With that, I'll turn it over to Minister Farnworth. Thank you uh, and good morning everyone. I'm honoured to be here on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking people and the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. Following the announcement by the RCMP and coroner today, I'd like to extend my condolences to the families of the three people who have lost their lives on Highway 99. We are aware of a further missing person. While the search is being suspended due to current conditions, the work will continue as soon as weather permits. To anyone who believes their loved one is missing and has not been able to make contact, please reach out to any RCMP detachment to make a report. This past week has challenged all of us time and time again. And while we've seen countless examples of heroism and community resilience, we are still very much responding to this emergency and we will be for the next short while. We must also recognize and appreciate those on the front lines who have done incredible, incredible work. This past week, the aptly named Community of Hope has shown unbelievable hospitality to displaced travelers. In Chilliwack, we've seen neighbors helping neighbors get the essentials. Merritt has been largely evacuated, but the community spirit remains strong as they're supported by hardworking staff and volunteers in Kelowna and Kamloops. I know that there have been challenges with a number of evacuees in a short window of time. But provincial staff and emergency support service centres around the province are stepping up to navigate backlogs and expedite, expedite emergency supports. For those who have been waiting, we will be re reimbursing accommodation costs for those who are eligible. The process for that reimbursement is being worked through right now. I've also had many opportunities to engage with the mayors and leadership of these and many more flood affected communities. And I can't tell you how proud I am of the way our province has come together. Proud of the way that local leadership has led and how the province, the military, search and rescue groups, fire and police departments, road crews and selfless everyday British Columbians are rolling up their sleeves and doing what needs to be done. We will get through this. We will get through this together if everyone plays and does their part. I know British Columbians have big hearts and are looking for ways to support. Trusted organizations like the Canadian Red Cross, the Salvation Army, BC food banks and the BC liquor stores are great ways to do so. But importantly, you can also help by following the measures announced yesterday on non-essential travel along the severely affected highways and by conserving fuel. If you can avoid travel, work from home or take public transit for the next 10 days, you will help ensure that we have the fuel and access and means to keep responding as we need to. Right now, we all need to do our part to make sure emergency vehicles and essential vehicles can do their jobs. As we pass through fall and head towards winter, I urge people to pay close attention to weather warnings given the unpredictability that comes with climate change. Environment Canada has issued a winter storm advisory for the North Coast and we're expecting heavy precipitation and wind. As the storm moves to the South Coast starting Sunday, rain will reach the heavily impacted areas in the Fraser Valley. Given the vulnerabilities, the existing conditions on the ground, Environment Canada is looking at issuing an advisory for this area. I encourage everyone to think about ways they can get prepared for potentially stormy weather in the days, weeks and months ahead. Based on what we've seen this week in BC, Environment Canada, whom I spoke with this morning, is speeding up development of a new ranking system for atmospheric rivers. This will help all of us be better prepared for everything from localized flooding and winds to bigger storm events. This new approach is based on a system the US is already using. I was briefed, as I said, by Environment Canada on this earlier today, and I want to thank the federal government for taking on this important work. 
As we've seen throughout the pandemic, staying calm will help us get through this next short period of time. Temporary, non-essential travel restrictions are in place for those traveling along sections of Highway 99, Highway 3 and Highway 7, which have been severely damaged. The temporary limitation on non-essential fuel consumption in southwestern BC is so we can keep commercial traffic moving, stable our supply chains and make sure that everyone gets home safely. Over the next 10 days, we know that we have enough gas for essential vehicles and everyone else who needs it if we are prudent and conserve where we can. In closing, I want to remind people that these restrictions are temporary. In the case of the fuel uh, situation, it's over the next 10 days. 10 days of us doing the right thing. In terms of the roads, it's about ensuring that our, our, um, our emergency vehicles and supply chain vehicles and commercial vehicles can continue to get through to where they're needed. So I'll now turn this update over to Minister Fleming. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Minister Farmworth, and good morning. Um, I want to start this morning's update with a uh, progress report on the first corridor that's been reestablished that we uh, announced yesterday afternoon connecting Metro Vancouver and the Fraser Valley with the rest of British Columbia. This is Highway 7 to Hope, which was damaged and repaired, and then Highway 3 uh, from Hope to the southern interior, which opened uh, days earlier than expected uh, yesterday afternoon at approximately 2 p.m. <clears throat> Of course, the segment of this route that begins in Agassiz and ends in Princeton is subject to uh, travel orders, restricted vehicles uh, only. Um, it is designed to allow for the movement of essential goods and services or for people who need to travel because they've been stranded for some days and are tr uh, seeking to get home to their primary residence. The full corridor was opened yesterday afternoon and I'm pleased to say it has performed well and this has been extremely helpful for goods movement in British Columbia connecting uh, the lower mainland uh, with the rest of the province. We've had roughly a couple of hundred commercial vehicles that have now gone through. I'm advised by the BC Trucking Association that from 192nd and 24th Avenue in the lower mainland to Karameos is currently taking trucks about 10 hours uh, on a fully functioning highway system that would normally take between five to six hours. So it is slow as we expected yesterday. Uh, there are single lane alternating traffic areas that, um, that are uh, making that a slower route and people need to drive to conditions. Um, the work is not done on the highway but it is functioning. There's a lot more to do to get the highway uh, back up to full condition. And um, I can't stress enough that keeping this corridor open right now is vital to British Columbia. It's vital to help uh, where certain goods are running short to get them on the move uh, through trucks to communities that are experiencing uh, pinch points in our supply chain. It's vital to allow people who have been un under the care and, and shelter of others to get home uh, to see their family and loved ones. So obey the, alter uh, the travel restrictions, but also when you, when you are permitted to use uh, a corridor like the number three, um, the last thing we want is to have to clear an accident uh, because of careless driving. Um, so I do want to thank people though because the reports are that people are driving patiently, they're driving in mixed traffic of passenger vehicles and trucks and they're being mindful of one another and, uh, and that is crucially important. Next update is on Highway 99. Um, this is subject to uh, travel orders as well that are, that are quite different than Highway uh, 3. Um, as Minister Farnworth acknowledged at the outset of this um, update. Uh, it is very sad, tragic news for the province that um, Search and Rescue and the RCMP have uh, confirmed the, the deaths of other individuals um, from the slide event and our thoughts are with their families and their loved ones um, at this time and um, RCMP and uh, Search and Rescue have been working with the Ministry of Highways um, congruently and with each other's support collaboratively both to unblock the road and also to uh, to uh, search for uh, people who are missing uh, and that is going to work is going to continue and we are able while that work is continuing to open the highway now at the same time that will happen today very shortly at noon um, and this will provide a second connection from the lower mainland uh, to the interior and the north um, this is the route beginning from Pemberton going through Lillooet uh, in this case it's designated for smaller vehicles uh, because of the train, uh, nothing larger than a cube truck uh, will be allowed on the highway at this time. That 
is part of the orders. The highway will be open to two lanes. Uh, we will have maintenance contractors uh, on patrol in this route. Um, we expect to see some high traffic volumes as those communities uh, that were cut off from one another are reconnected and I would urge everyone uh, that will begin to use Highway 99 this afternoon to plan accordingly and to drive safely. Highway 1, uh, very briefly, the stretch of highway east of Chilliwack to Bridal Falls, uh, the area uh, moving out towards Hope. It has been closed but, pr but crews have made good progress on that stretch of the Highway 1 and we're hopeful that we can have that reopened to, to limited travel uh, by this evening and we'll provide further updates to the media including what, if any, travel restrictions there are going to be uh, on that part of um, Highway 1. We, it's currently not under a, a travel order, but when it does reopen, um, we're going to ask people to be very careful. There will be crews continuing to work on that stretch of Highway 1. It's too early to say on the other stretch of Highway 1 that is still remains underwater in the Abbotsford Sioux Mass area when it can reopen uh, until those waters recede more and we can get engineers on site to inspect the condition of that road. Um, but we will continue to work uh, with Minister Popham and uh, farmers and the uh, and, and uh, Abbotsford and Chilliwack governments on getting on ways to get feed and water uh, to animals in the Sumas prairies. Heading over to Vancouver Island, uh, some good news for people getting in and out of the capital region along Highway One. Last evening, the highway opened to two-way traffic, so no longer single lane alternating. We have two lanes uh, flowing in each direction. It is still an active construction site. I would stress repairs are continuing and will be for a number of months. So drivers need to be prepared for ongoing delays there. But a huge thank you uh, to people who have been working for many days and nights uh, to get the Malahat number one uh, back in the condition uh, that it is and to be able to announce that uh, there are two lanes in each direction. Highway 19 uh, north of uh, Nanaimo has been closed since Thursday afternoon because of a sinkhole. Uh, we're hoping to get that reopened tonight. Um, in the meantime, would urge everybody to avoid that section of Highway 19. Uh, if you can, there is a detour in place, but the delays on this detour can be quite long. Uh, and similar to the Malahat, permanent repairs will uh, take likely upwards of months. Uh, further closures will be needed to get uh, significant work periods to uh, remediate and fix that. We'll communicate with the public in advance of any work that's going to be done and when that will be available for use. Um, there's a lot of updates uh, on various road closures and reopenings. Uh, I would direct uh, everybody listening to this briefing to consult drivebc.ca. We now have an emergency travel information click button there that organizes the information that you might be seeking. Um, further on the weather that Minister Farnworth addressed, uh, addressed uh, the heavy rains forecast for the north, uh, the Ministry of Transportation has extra crew and equipment on standby to respond as necessary. Uh, we put notifications out last night on Drive BC, and those will continue to be updated as the forecast uh, becomes clear. Um, just want to speak a little bit about our partnership with federal government and federal jurisdiction on, uh, on, on corridors. Uh, reopening the vital highway corridors has been our primary responsibility. Um, we have now established a goods and supplies, a supply chain rather, a supply chain recovery working group. Um, the working group was formally announced earlier this morning, but we've already begun to, met, uh, to meet and we've begun our work. It involves the provincial and federal governments. We're working with private sector companies and industry, industry stakeholders uh, right across the supply chain. And, and this is really about developing options that can be actioned immediately to get essential goods to market, uh, given the challenges and constraints that we face. Um, highway routes are beginning to open, as you've heard. Uh, both CP and CN Rail are continuing to uh, make assurances that their rail operations will be up and running at some point next week. They're reporting good progress. Uh, we will be advising on uh, the need to balance community needs with the national economic interest as we uh, uh, address uh, bottlenecks that are accumulating in the, in the port and other parts of our supply chain. Uh, we will look at ways to divert traffic and establish new logistics chains. And um, to this end, I want to again extend my gratitude to my federal counterpart, uh, Minister Al Gabra, for his continued support um, that we are getting from Ottawa to get our supply chains up and running. And uh, finally, just in closing, um, to staff in the ministry, to our road maintenance contractors, to everybody who's in the, been in the fight to reopen highways, I can't thank people enough. People have been up day and night working around the clock. Uh, the updates today would not be possible without uh, people working at an accelerated, exhausting pace, uh, working together with local government, with fire departments, with, uh, with really everybody, the military, uh, to be able to um, Plan, plan, plan the attack on getting highways reopened and, and to that end uh, we owe a debt of gratitude to ministry personnel who 
uh, have been doing this on behalf of all British Columbians. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you to all British Columbians who are hanging together right now and showing that extra patience that's needed. Uh, it means everything. Water and emergency feed continue to be a high priority for the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Fish. Uh, this morning, we were able to airdrop four tons of feed to a hog farm in Abbotsford to feed about four to 5,000 hogs. This is a coordinated effort between, uh, with Clearbrook, Clearbrook Milling, who is allowing for a staging area uh, to gather that, that feed, and then BC Wildfire Service is moving it by helicopter to the impacted farms. Our ministry is working very closely with suppliers at the port and the feed mills in Abbotsford, and the result is, is that we've secured ingredients that are now being shipped to three main Abbotsford feed mills so that livestock will be getting feed. We believe we've secured feed for about five to six days. Uh, we'll be uh, looking probably outside the port at that time, but we have had an extremely generous offers from uh, the federal government, Alberta and Saskatchewan, who have reached out to support, and even our neighbors in Washington state have offered uh, supplies for us. Our ministry staff has been having daily video meetings with industries that are most effective, which includes dairy, poultry, hogs, cattle, and of course, feed mills and suppliers. We're continuing to work very hard on the permitting process to allow farmers to get back into their farms as needed. Uh, the province is facilitating the military support that was made available yesterday, and this is going to help farmers access their farms in a safer and uh, quicker uh, manner as the conditions allow. Uh, farmers in the agricultural sector are considered essential as far as moving about on our highway system and uh, we have had uh, good success I think seeing food being moved through the Fraser Valley into the lower mainland. In fact we have farmers from Coston that left late last night uh, traveling down Highway 3. They had no problems and they have a large uh, vehicle filled with food that supplies some of our Vancouver farmers markets which are very important food hubs during time of emergency. So they've had success there and I believe we've even had a farmer from the Fraser Valley attending their, their farmers market which is pretty incredible. It's just such resilience in our agriculture sector. We are assembling a team to plan cleanup and we're working with industry associations on that. We're working closely with West Coast Reduction, which is located at the Port of Vancouver and other companies. Uh, CFIA is also supporting this discussion and we are having conversations with municipalities about accessing landfills for disposal. And finally, on um, the issue of veterinarians, we have uh, a, list that's, uh, a list that's growing daily. We have about 70 vets that can be made available who are from British Columbia. We are not aware of any medication shortages, but my uh, deputy Tommy Thier did send a, a note out across the country uh, just um, putting a mark down that if we need anything, uh, asking if people would be able to contribute and, and th there has been great success with that reach out. Uh, all of our, our neighbours are willing to uh, help us in that regard. Even the Chief Vet from Washington has offered assistance if we need it and we appreciate that very much. Um, as far as moving veterinarians in and out of the valley, we've had a generous offer from Randy Wright from Harbor Air to allow us to fly folks into Harrison Lake and then uh, distribute them as needed. So uh, my request, I think, at this time is for British Columbians to continue to tread lightly around each other and show that patience that's needed. The best thing you can do right now is follow the orders so that we have the resources uh, that will allow us to continue to respond to this uh, very difficult situation. I'd also like to say to the farmers right now that have had no sleep and are going through an incredibly emotional, difficult time, thank you for all of your efforts. I know you're helping each other, you're working with your communities, and you're trying to get back online, and all of our hearts are with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. A reminder to reporters on the line, please press star one to enter the queue. You will be limited to one question and one follow-up. We'll start in the room with Keith Baldry, Global News. A uh, question for Minister Farnworth. Any thought given to asking Ottawa to move up that November 30 sort of um, 
when the rule kicks in, no, no PCR re uh, tests required to go across the border, surely that would ease the pressure on the gas market Metro Vancouver, allowing people to go to Bellingham and Blaine to fill up. No, that's a, a, a very good question, and thanks for that. Uh, I have been uh, on the phone uh, with uh, Minister Blair, uh, and uh, the, uh, the Premier's office is also being in touch with the federal government. Uh, we would like to see them lift uh, that, uh, that use of the PCR. Um, it's going to be done anyway on the 30th of November, so why not do it now? I put the request into Minister Blair, and uh, he's busy working on that. Follow-up, Keith? Yes, for Mr. Farnworth and probably Mr. F uh, Minister Fleming as well. Um, the, um, just to, is, is there an update on the request for gasoline from the United States? The Premier talked about reaching out as far as California, also Alberta. Any sense when gas could, could actually arrive? And also, Minister Fleming, if any chance of, uh, will you ask CP to prioritize its shipments once that rail line opens to, for such things as gasoline and food over other goods? Um, in, in uh, both of those, uh, on, on to both of those questions, uh, in terms of gas coming up from uh, Alberta, uh, sorry, from uh, Washington State, Oregon, and California, we have been actively in discussions with, uh, with with gas companies down there. It would be barged up. It would take about three days uh, from the farthest to actually to be able to get them up here. But that work is in progress. Uh, I can tell you that uh, in terms of CP Rail, uh, the railways when they when they reopen, that the transport of fuel is uh, a top priority. Next question, David Ball, CBC. Minister, just about the travel restrictions um, and the highways opening, the 99 and the 3, which vehicles are those open to? You said the cube truck uh, maximum size for the 99. Is that just essential, Phil? Thank you. Yes, on the 99, it's passenger vehicles, uh, no larger than a, a cube truck. So if somebody owns a cube truck as their vehicle or is moving um, things that they evacuated um, they can but that's the largest size of the vehicle it's just because of the road condition there uh, and we do not want uh, heavy commercial vehicles on, on that route and um, and so that will uh, open uh, this afternoon shortly and uh, people are gonna have to be patient drive very safely and slowly and observe the driving conditions that are there uh, and uh, uh, we will, uh, on the number three, the restrictions are um, somewhat the opposite. It is prioritized for commercial vehicles. Of course, passenger vehicles can be on that route, um, but essential travel uh, on the number three is for people returning home who have been stranded in other communities. Uh, so their primary residence is in the South Interior and they're trying to get home. Do you have a follow up, David? Uh, yes, just to clarify, so the 99 has no no essential restrictions for travel. Anyone can travel there that's a small vehicle. We want people to travel for essential purposes, which is reconnecting with their primary address. Um, we don't want people, you know, using as a commuter route just now. Um, these restrictions are in place north of Pemberton through the Lillooet slide area um, because uh, that, is a, that is a road that remains damaged, uh, that has highway crews working on it, and of course, as I mentioned, uh, still an active search and rescue and RCMP presence. Next question, Monica Gould, City News. Hi, uh, first question uh, regarding these gas limitations. Um, I mean, as soon as it was announced, we saw gas stations busy, long lines, people filling up jerry cans. Uh, was it maybe a mistake to announce this? Was it a mistake to maybe put these restrictions? Because it seems to have caused a panic um, and people hoarding, which was sort of what the province had been trying to avoid. We have seen uh, gas lines uh, forming uh, for a number of days now. Um, the reality is, is we uh, made the decision based on the information we have about the supply of gas uh, coming into the province. And it's critical that we make sure that it is available uh, for the emergency services and for the ability to move uh, and transport goods around. Uh, and this is a critical period of, uh, of about 10 to 11 days, 10 days as of you know, today. And that's why the, uh, the level, uh, the limit of 30 litres has been put in place. Uh, yesterday when I made the announcement, I said, I expect there will be people who will not want to respect that. But I also know this, the overwhelming majority of British Columbians will do the right thing and respect that 30 litre limit. Uh, we have seen time and time again through the challenges that we face that most people in this province will do the right thing. 
I can also tell you that uh, gas uh, stations, um, and we've been in discussion with the gas companies, uh, are moving as quickly as they can to where um, the gas uh, meter will automatically click off at 30 liters. Um, the bottom line is this. People understand that we are in a very challenging situation, that our supply routes have been significantly damaged, that there are people who, thousands of people who've been displaced, huge impacts in our agricultural sector, that we have to maintain our supply routes, we have to be able to get goods uh, to where they're needed, and we have to have our emergency uh, services functioning. And that means for this 10 days, we all have to do our part. And that means that the, uh, the 30 liter limit per fill up, or every time you fill, uh, is, is there. Uh, it doesn't mean that, you know, three days later you can't go back. Uh, it just means that uh, right now, 30 liters is the maximum that you can take. Is it a challenge? Yes. Is it inconvenience? Of course it is. But it's also going to get us through this critical period. Monica, do you have a follow up? Thank you. Yes, I also wanted to talk about the list of essential vehicles or, yeah, which vehicles are deemed um, essential and that those ones that are able to get more than 30 litres. Um, we're hearing from some security services companies, security guards, um, who say they have been left off. Um, is this intentional? Was it maybe an oversight? Um, would the province maybe explore adding them in? They, they say they should be deemed essential, given the work that they do. Um, any comment on that? Um, the way that the, uh, it is structured is that uh, the, the fuel depots that are serviced, for example, uh, let's say the city of Vancouver or a fire department, they get all the fuel that they need to get through that current system. If they're using a card lock uh, system, they are able to access all the feud fuel that they currently need. Um, the rest of us, um, it is 30 liters at a fill. That does not mean that you can't uh, go back and get uh, additional uh, fuel at, uh, at another, at what it means is, is we need to be careful in our travel uh, and so obviously someone engaged in that you know will uh, require and will go back uh, but people need to uh, recognize that a 30 liter limit it's the next 10 days that's what's going to get get us through this next question Nick Johansson Castanet Nick you there all right, moving on, we'll go to Sarah Anderson, Daily Hive. Can you hear me there? Oh, sorry, yeah, we'll keep with Nick. Thank you, Nick. Please go ahead. Hi, this question is for Minister Farnworth. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, Minister, two journalists, uh, Amber Bracken and Michael Toledano, uh, were arrested while doing their jobs covering the Wet'suwet'en conflict yesterday. Um, they were doing a job that all levels of Canadian courts have repeatedly highlighted the importance of. Uh, my question to you as the minister who oversees the RCMP in this province, uh, is will the RCMP, uh, who have once again appeared to infringe on Canada's constitutionally protected free press, face any repercussions? Uh, all I will comment on at this point is that the, uh, the RCMP uh, were enforcing a court injunction. Uh, as you know, I do not direct uh, the RCMP. I do know that uh, two journalists were detained and were subsequently released. Do you have a follow-up, Nick? Yes, Minister, can you explain to British Columbians why uh, during this natural disaster the RCMP, uh, along with helicopters, have been sent to this isolated logging road in the north of the province? Uh, there is a, uh, a court uh, injunction that is in place uh, that uh, the court has ordered and forced. Uh, operational decisions uh, on that are made by the RCMP and they are not uh, made by myself as Solicitor General. Next question, Cole Schistler, Black Press. Hi there. Thanks for taking my question. As a brief anecdote to Keith's earlier question, uh, I traveled through the U.S. from the Lower Mainland to the interior yesterday, and a PCR test was not asked for when I crossed back into Canada. Um, so my question is, with uh, Highway 99 reopening and Highway 7 to Highway 3 now open, um, is there any need for people to travel through the U.S.? I guess is it advisable for British Columbians to travel through Washington for, you know, essential reasons. I'll let uh, Minister Fleming deal with that question, but I, before that I will just say this. Uh, that's why we've asked uh, Minister Blair on the PCR test issue, uh, the border, so we can make it, uh, the, to, to make it clear that uh, that, uh, that exemption uh, for here in British Columbia uh, needs to be in place and uh, we feel, feel it needs to be in place as quickly as possible.
Yeah, I would just add that um, the um, expeditious uh, clearing of trucks is of particular importance to our supply chains right now. Having another route uh, through northern Washington uh, back into the interior of the province uh, from the lower mainland will be a, a supply chain that we may need for some months. Um, we'll have updates on the Coquihalla number no. 5 and uh, what a, a, a plan may look like if we can restore service and when, but I would suggest that and thank uh, U.S. Customs and Border Patrol, Canadian uh, Border Security Agency, and others who have helped uh, uh, make it easier for uh, truckers to do what are called transit routes uh, through uh, Washington State now uh, back into British Columbia. Cole, do you have a follow-up? No, I'm good, thank you. Thank you very much. For the next question, we go to Ethan Cox, Ricochet Media. Thank you very much. Um, this is a question for Mr. Farnworth. Um, just to follow up on the question about the two journalists who were arrested, I, I, I wanted to understand, first of all, you, you said just now that they were released. Can you confirm they've been released? Because their outlets uh, are not aware of that. Uh, what I can tell you is the information that I am aware of, and that is that the, uh, the RCMP, uh, in the course of enforcing that uh, uh, court-ordered injunction, uh, that there were two journalists uh, who were detained and that they have subsequently been released. That is the information that I have. Ethan, do you have a follow-up? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I, I just wanted to ask Mr. Farnworth, um, at what point does your duty of oversight come into play? Because we've seen the RCMP have been acting at odds with the courts. We've seen multiple court rulings this year which found that the RCMP's conduct, particularly towards journalists, was unlawful. So you always respond to these questions by saying, oh, look, it's at arm's length. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm not going to direct policing operations. But you are the democratic authority that has control over the RCMP. You're supposed to have oversight. So, you know, why, why are you not able to do anything to make sure that the RCMP is complying with the court's direction and not doing things which are clearly illegal, like arresting journalists? I oversee the Police Act uh, and uh, public safety uh, in the province of British Columbia. I do not direct the police, and you do not want politicians directing the police. For uh, complaint processes, for people who feel that, there are, uh, that their rights uh, um, have been infringed, there are complaint processes in place, legislated complaint processes that, that, uh, that can be accessed uh, by people. And I can tell you that they are, uh, and that those, uh, those complaints are investigated and are bodies that, uh, that do that. Next question, Robert, uh, Robert Tuttle, Bloomberg News. Yeah, hi. I'm wondering if there's any thought to suspending the LCFS program regarding fuels um, during this uh, crisis, or has that already been done? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the uh, the acronym um, that 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 you're you're you're, you're mentioning. Uh, we have uh, uh, technical. Um, uh, yeah, could you repeat the question? Fuel standard program. Oh, the, the yes. low car, oh, okay, yeah. So yes, there is discussion about uh, whether there's an ethanol shortage around the um, LCFS standards and uh, how the province might respond. Right now, the job is on reestablishing supply. So the updates we gave you today from CP Rail, uh, where they're pre-positioning fuel um, tankers uh, that could get back on rail uh, restored, the um, sourcing of supply from Washington State, Oregon, and California. Uh, that's our number one goal, compatibility of U.S. fuel and Canadian fuel standards. Obviously, in a crisis, uh, you make uh, prudent decisions that are going to help people. This is going to be a short-term supply challenge, uh, and uh, we're, we'll work with the federal government and other regulatory agencies to have common sense uh, approaches to whatever we need to do to, su to uh, alleviate supply pinches. Robert, do you have a follow-up? So, yes, you are looking to suspend that program temporarily? I can't give you an up-to-date uh, note about what that decision looks like other than to say it's been circled in as, as an issue that we might uh, run out of some of those uh, additives like ethanol uh, just as we resupply uh, uh, fuel that is, um, uh, that, that, uh, is, is of a different, uh, uh, different standard or has different low-carbon additives. So um, we'll advise as that, if that materializes as an issue how we're going to handle it. Next question, Peter Mitham, Country Life. 
Mr. Popham, um, and pops, possibly also uh, Minister Fleming, but um, Minister Popham remarked on uh, farmers' markets in Vancouver being supplied, but um, my understanding or my observation here is that uh, a lot of the grocery stores have not been stripped as bare as uh, those, say, east of Langland in the interior. And so I'm just curious to know if those 200 commercial trucks that uh, headed to the interior since yesterday uh, were delivering grocery or food materials and the like to restock and ensure that British Columbians in the interior um, have adequate access to food. Hi, Peter. Thank you for the question. So as far as I know, that, that there, were, there were food deliveries with those trucks going through, and, and that's, that's good news. Um, we do need to see that food moving um, both ways in the province to restock those, those shelves. But we also know there's food coming in from uh, the Alberta side, uh, which is also restocking. I think, um, you know, initially there was uh, some hoarding happening, and in some cases, that's, gonna, that's continuing. But we also see that British Columbians are starting to understand uh, that they need to do their part. And um, we see some incredible acts of generosity, of sharing. Uh, I did hear a story yesterday about a community, a, a block that got together and kind of inventoried their, their resources and, and their sharing in that way. So um, I think everyone understands it's all hands on deck and, and those shelves will be restocked. We do not have a food shortage. And so I think um, we'll, we'll see that start to lev level out over the next little while. Peter, do you have a follow-up? Yes, uh, thanks. Um, we've, se we've seen over the past year that the food system is fairly resilient. However, uh, BC Milk Marketing Board had indicated that there was a critical shortage of BC's milk supply directly related to the catastrophic floods. And so I'm just, I know we're all scrambling for information, but I uh, just was curious to know if you have any sense, Minister Popham, of the... Uh, or the hit that uh, milk production, chicken production, egg production has taken, uh, if there's any clear sense of the percentage by which those particular commodities are down as a result of the flooding. Well, we're still doing that uh, analysis right now, but we also learned yesterday that thankfully uh, the milk pickups have been continuing through the Fraser Valley now. So uh, we're going to see things start to come back online. And uh, as I've mentioned before, we are part of supply management. So other parts of Canada will also start to pick up the slack as far as being able to supply British Columbia. But um, of course, there will be uh, some of that, uh, the supply that we were seeing coming from the Fraser Valley for eggs and poultry and dairy. There's no doubt that it'll be affected. But uh, um, as far as our food supply, uh, we're going to be okay. Next question, Gordon Hoekstra, Vancouver Sun. Oh, hello there. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any sense with this uh, additional forecast uh, rain in uh, you know southwestern BC, whether what that might mean for you know flood levels, you know, in the Fraser Valley or any kind of other risk areas. Um, so, in terms of the uh, the the as rain moves uh, rain moves south, uh, what I've been advised by uh, Environment Canada is they're looking at about 20 to 40 millimeters of rain. Normally that would not be uh, an issue in terms of concern, but obviously given uh, the current, uh, uh, the saturation that we have seen in the ground, uh, we're following that very closely. Obviously with the, uh, the number of people on the ground, um, you know, on the dikes, uh, working to ensure that, uh, that, that everything that we can do uh, to make sure that uh, we're able to deal with, with, with water, whether it's rising or wherever it's going and the cleanup and that, uh, we're watching very closely uh, to make sure that uh, everybody's aware, uh, alerted and, and prepared. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, work in constant contact uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Environment Canada on the, on the situation as it changes uh, very quickly. Gordon, do you have a follow-up? Um, I, I do. Yeah, the minister partially answered it already. I just was wondering if there's sort of any, any, any additional, you know, kind of preparations or, you know, resources or communication that's being uh, considered as this rain is, you know, expected to arrive, you know, I believe Sunday. 
Right. I'd say right now the, the, the key is communication, watching what happens uh, with, this, uh, with the weather uh, as it comes down over the next uh, few days. Uh, as I said, there are significant resources on the ground, uh, as, as we know already, and obviously we will be watching, and if there are issues and challenges, then resources will be deployed to those areas. But the critical piece right now is to have good communication with, uh, with Environment Canada so that we're able to, on, a, on an hourly uh, basis, understand uh, what, you know, the, the weather and the, what to expect and if it changes and, and, and what will that mean. Thank you very much. That concludes today's update. Our next scheduled update is set for Monday, November the 22nd.